Hello, everybody. Dr. Lonnie Stewart here from the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. Are you a physical therapy student about to start studying for the National Physical Therapy Examination? Or maybe you're a professor, a program director, or a clinical instructor who teaches DPT students preparing for the NPTE? Either way, we would recommend checking out our sponsor, NPTE Final Frontier, and the community they've built around preparing for and succeeding on the NPTE. That exam and the preparation that goes along with it can be long, tedious, difficult, and stress-inducing, but it doesn't have to be. NPTE Final Frontier has the tactics and resources to help address all of the usual barriers. They even have scholarships to help with NPTE study courses, FSBPT registration fees, and even research opportunities. And if that's not enough, they're even donating to the very first annual HET Podcast Scholarship to be awarded at the end of every year. Go to NPTEFF.com for all of the details and use code HET for 10% off all purchases. Links to both the NPTE Final Frontier and their scholarship options are available in the show notes. And now, let's get ready to learn. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. F. Scott Field, and I have with me a new co-host to the team, a uh, friend of the podcast. She's been on several times, done a lot of good work for us, so we we had to bring her on, uh, Dr. Kaylee Brockway. Kaylee, how the heck are you? Hey there, Scott. I'm doing so good. How are you in this freezing cold Texas weather? Yeah, getting by. We're surviving. Uh, it's not supposed to get this cold, so uh, no. I think uh, you know Texans think it's the end of the world, but uh, we will survive. I promise. Uh, I'm that from New will. York. I've been through it. We'll we'll be all right. I hope. And I'm from Michigan. I've seen worse. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So let's talk about this. Let's uh, let's start with your your academic background and and what you what you've kind of navigated to lead you to where you're at today. Let's start there. Sure. So I have gotten both my undergrad and my doctor in physical therapy degree from Grand Valley State University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Like I said, I'm from Michigan. So I lived and practiced in Grand Rapids after graduating in 2013 in so many different settings. So I worked in outpatient ortho, outpatient neuro, inpatient rehab, acute care, skilled nurse, or not skilled nursing, subacute rehab. And then I was pulled into home health, which was the exact same company that I did a rotation with while I was in school. And that's where I really like found the love. For all of the things that I do in geriatrics and chronic disease management and organ transplant and cardiovascular and pulmonary. And while I was practicing, I was getting really frustrated because I was seeing things coming to me on referrals from other therapists at different facilities that were just not up to par with what I thought was good patient care. And they weren't even in line sometimes with what my patients actually had. Um, you can't give someone a four out of five lower extremity strength when they have a spinal cord injury, you know, that, that doesn't, yeah. that doesn't line up. Yep. So I, I kind of made it my goal. Like I need to make sure that these therapists coming out into the world, like have the best quality education and are doing things the right way. My goal with my practice has always been to help as many people as possible. And now I am so blessed that I get the chance to help even more people and multiply that logarithmically through my students you know, practicing for a while, I was just like, you know, if I'm going to really do this, I need to get into academia. So I did a few educational sessions for Grand Valley State University, which was amazing, and then moved to Texas. And I got involved with the University of St. Augustine here. I've been teaching with them for four years now. I am the lead instructor for geriatrics, pharmacology, patient care management courses, and of course, cardiovascular and pulmonary among several other things that I'm not the lead for, but still teach. As of a month ago in December, I just completed my doctorate in education. So now yes. I get to be double doctor. Doctor, doctor, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> so you. if you had to sum up, I mean, you do a ton. Uh, and and I love that because I, I too, I've taught eight different classes since I started uh, teaching. And you know, it, I, I like the idea of A, being adaptable, B, being like a Swiss army knife, um, and and C, taking on some courses that may be a challenge to me and that maybe I'm not the best at or great at because I need to learn. I need to go back and refresh myself and my skills and, and make sure that I'm trying to keep up with best practices. So if you had to really su summarize and, and culminate your specialty and what you do, what would that be? I would say that from an educational standpoint, my specialty is really teaching students 
what to do with the basics of what they already know. They know anatomy, they know physiology, or we hope they do, right? We, by the time they get to me in our program, they've already had those courses, both in undergrad and in the PT program. So my job then is to take that knowledge and push it forward into actual patient care, show what it looks like in real life and teach them then how to assess it and what to do about it. I love that because A, it, it kind of starts with like the student centric model, right? Like they're, they're at the center of this and we're trying to create safe practitioners out of them and mold them into clinical thinking and critical thinking minds. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they already know a lot of info. I mean, they, they yeah. have foundational basics. Most of them, you know, they're, they're yeah. pretty good. We just got to refine them and get them to that yeah. point and really push them out and, and, and graduate competent, safe practitioners, you know, yep. entry I, level stuff. I usually stuff. start every term with telling them, like, I don't know any more than you do. I just know how to use it better than yeah. you do. And that's, that's what I'm going to teach you today. Thousand percent. That's pattern recognition. You've just yeah. been doing it for so long. You can see it and pick it out better and then know what to do with it. Yeah. Um, and we, we, you know, we can't expect them to know that stuff because they haven't done it yet. They don't have right. the repetitions. Yep. But luckily we do. So tell us a little bit about why you love education, why you love the transfer of knowledge and why you got into to academia. And now for a quick shout out to our newest sponsor, Varela Financial. If you're a physical therapist and you have student loan debt, you got to talk to these guys. What makes them unique is that they view financial planning like running hurdles on a track. And for PTs, the first hurdle many of us run into is student loan debt. Varela Financial will help you get over that hurdle. They not only take the time to explain to you which plans you individually qualify for and how those plans work, but they also take the time to show you what your individual case looks like mapped out within each option. So if you're looking for help on your student loan debt or any area of personal finances, we recommend working with them. I use Varela Financial personally, and they were able to help me lower my student loan repayment from about $1,800 a month down to about $135 per month simply by finding the right repayment plan that best fit me, my family, and our life goals. You can check them out at varelafinancial.com. Link is in the show notes if you need it for reference, and tell them the HET podcast crew sent you. And now back to the show. When I was working in home health, which is where I was for just over six years before I moved to Texas, I was seeing a lot of evidence coming through on chronic disease management and exercise and cardiovascular management, pulmonary management of disease. And all of those things were fully within my scope of practice as a physical therapist. Like I can work on weight management. I can educate about fluid restriction. I can provide exercise that will help produce literal remodeling of the tissues of the heart if I do it properly, right? And there's evidence out there to show this, not just how to do it, but for what conditions. But none of that evidence was being translated into practice. I, I started like working on reviews of like literature reviews of what was out there for high intensity interval training after attending a really exciting session at CSM in 2015 about high intensity interval training to manage diabetes. And what I found out was like, it's not just diabetes, it's every chronic disease and multiple chronic diseases that this is the ideal exercise prescription for. And uh, I started practicing this in home health and teaching others how to do it. And everyone kept asking me, like, are, are you going to do any clinical trials with this? This is so new. And I was like, no, it's not new. We don't need any more clinical trials. We've got tons of clinical trials. Yeah. We, we need integration into practice. You know, we need to push that evidence into translation into what we're already doing. And that's what, exactly what I try to do in my classroom too. Um, it may be ahead of the board exam, but I'm always pulling the most recent articles on this is what this looks like in practice. Yeah. Here's what the best evidence is for heart auscultation percussion in practice. I, I'm always trying to push the envelope on what is best practice and what we're teaching as best practice and how to integrate that, whether it's crazy or not. Some people think that, you know, using these types of interventions is a little bit pushing the envelope too far, but I'm okay with that. I'm kind of known for being a boat rocker and that's how we make progress. Yeah. Well, I, I love the fact that again, like when I think of like people that I can go to when I have questions about things, you know, uh, the, the top of your, your pyramid, I kind of think, you know, like 
geriatrics, complex patients, cardiopulm. Then I think about the high intensity interval training, right? Then I think about evidence-based practice and like, you know, you, you just have such a, a great foundation and a great, really, I don't want to call it a niche because it's, it's not, it's not terribly niche down, but at the same time, there's just so many cool factors that you pulled in from all of the courses and things you teach that it, it just really makes you one of the best well-rounded practitioners that I can think of that's that's out and not only treated the stuff and done the stuff, but is now actually showing, hey, here's what we do in the real world, but mm -hmm. also here's the stuff you need to know for the board exam, right? And, and yeah. the textbook stuff. And that's one of the big things I tell my students is like, look, we're going to teach you the gold standard in the textbook. But as soon as you step out into the real world, most of your patients are not going to fit the textbook model. And we've got to be critical thinkers and clinical thinkers to figure out the differences mm -hmm. and then what to do with those differences. And that's why we joke around when we say, yeah, it depends. But the yeah. whole it depends thing means you have to come up with why it depends and what to do with it, you know? Exactly. Um, and, and one of my goals then is to like get this stuff into the textbooks. Yeah. So I have written a chapter in the musculoskeletal interventions textbook about using high intensity interval training in the older adult population, regardless of their conditions and all of that, because once it's in the textbook, that's what we write the board exam off of. Yeah. Right. And then it becomes a little more integrated into baseline entry level right. education years later. But yeah, it, it, does, <laughs> yeah. it does eventually make it and trickle it gets there. down. Right. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I have one uh, kind of big question that we ask all of our guests. Uh, I think you've probably answered it before, but we'll, we always like to ask it on every episode. If there was one aspect of higher education, whether it be DPT or otherwise, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? I think DPT education needs to have so much more interprofessional integration. Mm. We don't function in silos, regardless of where we practice. Even in home health, when I'm out there in the field on my own by myself, I'm still emailing my OT, emailing my PTA, calling the physician, working with the case manager. None of us work alone. And it's so important for us to learn the skills about how to work with each other and how to work within the different disciplines, how to communicate our needs briefly but effectively, and how to use the tools that are going to make our communication most effective for the best outcomes of the patient. I just think that that needs to be really heavily integrated into any entry level allied health professions and medical education. I'm working towards that as much as I can. I'm always working with our on campus partners and our virtual partners to develop simulations and experiential learning activities where we pull in our nurse practitioners, we pull in our physician assistants, we pull in our occupational therapists, our speech pathologists. Recently, I had our um, second year students start giving SBAR reports to the next incoming provider, which for some of them is an OT, some of them it's an SLP, and they have to make their SBAR relevant to that person that they are giving it to. So they have to have some type of understanding of what this person does, right? And it has turned into such an educational opportunity, not just for the students, but for the professors who are serving in that role of receiving yeah. as well. And I just, I think we need so much more communication interdisciplinary to help improve our practice. Well, and that's kind of why this podcast was started, right? To break down the silos, to learn about best practices in all teaching in healthcare and just see, you know, what other professions are doing and how we can incorporate that, how we can work together. And, you know, I love the SBAR assignment because it's something so simple, but it changes pretty dramatically based on who's coming in the room next, you know? And, and so yeah. knowing how to talk to each different professional and, and why, and what would be pertinent information is huge. And I yeah. think, you know, interprofessional education there, especially for a, a university like ours, where we have several different healthcare providers under one roof, it makes total sense. It, you know, it's a breeze. It may be a little tougher for some universities that don't have that, but you know, where there's a will, there's a way, you know? That's so right. I think yeah. uh, we're seeing that more and more now, how important interprofessional education is, especially as, you know, a profession, we try to move toward competency-based education. Yep. Uh, a lot of professions are already doing that. So we might as well learn from them and, and you know, piggyback off them a little bit. And we'll be presenting one of our projects with a telehealth nurse practitioner visit 
um, at the Southern Nurses Research Symposium in February with our very nurse cool. practitioner faculty. So nice. I'm very excited about that. Awesome. Well, Kaylee, thank you so much for coming on. I can't wait to see some of your future episodes and uh, who you bring on to the show and, and what you guys chat about. So where can people reach out to you and find you if they have any questions or, or follow up for you? Absolutely. So you all can find me on the app formerly known as Twitter or X at Dr. B the PT. You can find me at Dr. B the PT.com. Dr. B the PT at gmail.com is the email address. Or you can reach me at my university email, which is kbrockway at usa.edu. I'm not hard to find with a good Google search. Awesome. We will put all those in the show notes so it's easy for everyone to find you. Kaylee, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And like I said, I can't wait to see what you uh, want to bring out and roll out into the podcast. Looking forward to it. Hello, everybody. Dr. F. Scott Field here, and we don't do this nearly enough. Uh, I wanted to thank you as an audience for being here, for listening to the shows. Without you guys, we wouldn't have anybody to geek out with uh, over education and learning and teaching and educating. So thank you for, for being here, for being you know faithful listeners over the years. Uh, also, if possible, we'd love to ask a favor. We don't do this often, but if you could leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to this podcast, we would greatly appreciate it. It helps boost our rankings and our algorithm and really just helps get this message out to more people out there in healthcare education who, who may need you know some of the episodes and the experts that we interview. So if you could, like I said, leave a rating and review, we would greatly appreciate it. And we will see you on the next show.